My name is Mel Craig. Uh, I, when I was in elementary school, I had a best friend. Everybody knew we were best friends. We were totally inseparable. And uh, we did everything together, rode our bikes, sun up to sundown. Um, when we went to middle school, uh, we started to do different things. She joined the soccer team, and I joined the chorus. Um, and I don't think that she and I changed too much fundamentally who we were. It was our environment that changed, that really changed the dynamic of our relationship. So that's really what I want to talk to you guys about today. The idea that you could have an environmentally contingent um, symbiosis, particularly in uh, obligate mutualists. So hosts and their microbes can have a number of interactions ranging from parasitic to mutualistic, from ephemeral and rare to permanent lifelong associations between two highly co species. And we're used to thinking about the role of the environment in terms of these transient parasitic um, pathogen interactions, uh, for example, in colds and humans. And with new tools, we've also been able to consider uh, the role of the gut microbiome in humans um, and possibly diets influencing the microbial communities in our guts. Um, but we haven't so much considered the role the environment can play in these obligate mutualisms uh, that are that can uh, be very, go back a very long way. So in vertebrates, um, our microbial communities are highly complex consortia of hundreds to thousands of uh, prokaryotic phylogenes. So invertebrate systems can actually provide a benefit here by providing relatively simple. Um, communities of, of microbes. And in insects in particular, and those that feed on plants, we have uh, systems where we have a handful of symbiotic gut bacteria. Um, and that way we can start to look at the role of the environment on these interactions, because we don't have as many players. What we really would like is a system where we could look at the interaction between one host and one symbiont, and really start to look at what is the role of the environment in mediating that interaction. So in insects that feed on plants, um, these microbial symbionts can provide a number of ecological functions. And there's a range of, of recent research that shows that these uh, microbial symbionts can provide the ability to synthesize nutrients, to degrade plant polymers, and to um, neutralize plant toxins. And this can be very important in terms of moving to a novel environment. So you can imagine that these symbionts could play a role either to constrain or to expand the ability of a host to utilize a resource. In insects, herbivorous insects, this could translate into their ability to use new host plants, which may play an important role for invasive species. And invasive species moving to a novel environment is actually um, an opportunity for us to study this process. I like this quote, those of us alive today are witnessing the consequences of a number of truly grand but unplanned biological experiments. And I think every time a species invades, that really is an opportunity for us to examine this unplanned biological experiment. And this happens quite a bit, considering habitat change and global transport a number of species are moving around the world at greater and greater rates. But only a fraction of these are going to be successfully established. Um, for example, 1 to 10 percent in the United States is our current estimate. And even though this doesn't sound like that much, these in invasions, when they're successful, they cause a lot of environmental damage. They transform the native community ecology. And they also have important economic costs. The cost of crop pests alone annually in the United States can be astronomical. So that brings us to this study species, Megacopta cerberia, which invaded in 2009 from Asia and has since spread all over the southern United States. And it harbors um, an extracellular gamma proteobacteria Ishikoella um, that is in its sister species in Asia, um, obligate mutualist. And that's part of what we wanted to test with Megacopta cerberia and its expanded North American range. 
And the question we wanted to ask was, is it possible that this obligate, vertically transmitted bacterial symbiont in its relationship with its host, the benefits that it provides to its host, are those benefits universal or could they possibly change in the context of different environments? So within the system, we wanted to look at the impact of the symbiont separate from the impact of host plant and could these two factors potentially interact? And we're able to do this in Megacopta because of this unique feature of its biology. Actually, mothers transmit vertically these symbionts in these externally packaged symbiont capsules that they then oviposit along with eggs. And nymphs that hatch out can then access and probe these capsules to ingest the symbiont and establish the symbiosis. And this provides us a powerful experimental tool. So what we did was um, we, our lab, um, Nicole Gerardo's lab, along with a number of um, undergraduate assistants, I couldn't have done all of this by myself, uh, we separated the eggs, uh, the symbiont capsules from the eggs, and then surface sterilized the eggs. He treated a portion of the symbiont capsules to result and reconstructed the egg masses to create a disruptive symbiosis as well as a normal symbiosis. And then we tracked the impact of this on the host development over time. We also wanted to look at this over different contexts. And we chose the, this is the putative preferred host plant for Megacopta, it's often called the kudzu bug. And it's also been seen by many on soy crops, and we wanted to see if this is which um, environment would, may have an effect, um, as well as sort of establish what is the role of this as a potential agricultural pest. And we looked at this with a normal <coughs> symbiosis and a heat-treated disrupted symbiosis for the purposes of the talk I'll just refer to as symbiote positive and symbiote negative. And again, looking at outcomes for the host fitness, development time, <coughs> juvenile survival, and adult body types. So we set up these field experimental plots and track the development from hatch to emergence and gather this information weekly. We would go out and count how many bugs are on each plant um, in these tents every week. And that went on for 23 weeks. So it was, it was quite a fun time with a lot of help. Um, and so as you can see here, there were differences observed. The impact of the symbiont was apparent. In the filled circles, you can see the symbiont positive treatments, and the empty circles are the symbiont negative. There's definitely an impact of the symbiont. There is also an impact of host plant as well. In the green, you can see the soy development, uh, development time to each life stage, and in the brown, you can see the kudzu. And what's interesting is that they developed faster on the soy than the kudzu, which we did not expect. Similarly, with survival, uh, you can see the survival curves are lower for the dashed lines indicated here for the symbiote negative treatments than for the symbiote positive, and survival was actually higher on soy than on kudzu. But a lot of what was happening in survival happened in these earlier time periods, so we wanted to focus on that time period, and also, we, so we brought it into the lab so we could get a little bit more control. And we focused on this, these early developmental stages from hatch to third instar. And in that time period, we saw for development time, symbiont absent treatments had much longer development time, which was very consistent with the field. Um, and overall, host plant was important, um, but in the symbiont positive treatments, there wasn't a real difference in development time. For survival, we also saw a consistent result with the field experiment that symbiont absent treatments in the dashed lines had much lower survival. And again, we saw sort of a different story in the symbiont positive treatments here. From the field experiment, we also noticed these morphological differences occurring between symbiont positive and symbiont absent treatments, especially here you can picture on soil. Um, in normal, Megacopta, they're hard and brown, kind of like a ladybug. Um, and without the symbiont, we saw that they became pale and soft, and their wings were curly. Really don't think they could fly, although we didn't give them much of a chance. Um, and then also, when 
we dissected out their crypt mid-guts, pictured here, uh, which is the location in the gut where these symbionts reside, the ones with the normal symbiosis had a normal, full, vaginated crypt mid-gut, whereas those uh, symbiont absent treatments had this emaciated vagin. In terms of body size, we also saw a difference here between the host plants, and we saw an effect of symbiont as well as well as an interaction between these two factors. And this occurred in females and in males as well. Um, and you can also see the effect of sex on body size, which was expected in this visit. So overall, looking at the interaction between symbiont and host fitness, so symbiont, symbiont absent treatments, we expected to see an impact of the symbiont from what we saw in Megacopta, work that had been previous done, previously done, um, and we wanted to look at this over different environments. And what we found is that across the different environments, the effect of losing this obligate symbiont had um, a difference in terms of, uh, had less of a difference on kudzu than it did on soy. So our overall conclusions are that the absence of the symbiont negatively impacted the host, um, and feel comfortable saying this is an obligate uh, mutualism. And there was better survival and better performance on soy than on kudzu, um, which could have potential implications for megacopta being declared an agricultural pest. And then also that this obligate mutualism was environmentally contingent. Um, and I think this has broader implications for our understanding of symbiosis, because these um, obligate mutualisms are not often considered in terms of environmental variability. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, Nicole Gerardo and the Gerardo Lab for all of their help um, doing these field studies and lab work. It was a, a lot of dissection. There's some way I could have done myself, and I'll take any questions you have. Um, so I already talked to you about the declarative test on soy. And it means, um, so soy and kedzi are both 